<clears throat> yeah, during the break, Deb was talking about um, how to do things, and <clears throat> I was I was thinking how um, I was thinking when I was a kid. I'd stand there and look in the refrigerator for something to eat and stuff, and my mom or stepfather would say, shut the door. You know, you can think about it with the door shut. But, you know, I'd stand there for 20 minutes looking, you know, and, and um, you know, leave a room with the lights on or stuff like that. And, and, um, and they were always coming in behind me and, and shutting stuff off. But, um, you know, when I got older, like now, um, you know, the electric bills can be quite hefty during this time of the year. Quite hefty. Devastating, Devastating is the word. <clears throat> and um, um, because it's my house, because I have to pay the bill, I am more mindful. Does that make sense? I mean, I'm more mindful because it's, it's mine. Well, I remember telling the church, our church group, many years ago, I said, you think this building belongs to me? This is your building. <laughs> it doesn't belong to me. And uh, the truth is we are able to pay these bills. One of the reasons is is because I don't take a salary so that we can have money to do what we need to do and take care of people that come. However, the real answer isn't <clears throat> for you to claim the building is yours, because then that's just selfish, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, isn't it? Isn't it doing it this, the wrong motivation? So the answer is Christ crucified, isn't it? <laughs> it's always the answer, and we all need him, and we all, you know, slip up. I mean, <clears throat> I've noticed me and Deb were getting a little older now and, and uh, we've forgotten a few things, you know, I was watering a bush outside and left the water running for about two hours and then remembered and went back and, and thank God where I was w watering it, it ran down to all the trees that were starting to get a little, you know, and I went, it's just the Lord, I'm a failure. <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, we all have our syndromes and whatever but Jesus is the answer for all of us. <clears throat> okay, we're in Philippians, and we're still continuing uh, along this line. And um, <clears throat> just to refresh a little bit, <clears throat> the first couple of verses remind us that, you know, it's one thing to be a benefactor of the cross. I mean, Jesus, Jesus died on the cross, you know. There's your, there's your basic... think the center bar is quite that there you go. Jesus died on the cross and you know in just your regular Christianity approach when you say that Jesus died on the cross what does that mean to you everyone starts speaking up and they start saying well it means I don't have to go to hell well it means I get to go to heaven well, it means that God, you know, has provided a way that he can heal my body. Or when I feel bad, he can make me feel good. Or you fo are you following that, G you know, excuse the mic for one second. But, uh, He died on the cross. Jesus died on the cross. And these are the immediate things that come to us is the benefits that come from his death on the cross. Paul's way past that. Paul is trying to get them <clears throat> to come to a place where um, um, they are motivated in the same spirit, the same mind, as, as we said, the proper translation, the same attitudes of Christ. Let his attitudes be in you. Okay, well, there's only one way to let the attitudes of Christ to be in you, you know. It's not by 
commandment, write, well, write them down and I'll work on it. You know, that's the way most people look at it, you know, commandments. Write it down and I'll work on it. That's not how you do it. <clears throat> if Christ is not life in you, then he's a religious figure. Can I get an amen? I mean, he's a religious figure. And uh, in one sense, um, the way that we approach religious figures, that means Jesus is no different than Buddha or any of the other you know, people that we esteem as religious figures, whether, we, whether they're considered God or not is not the issue. They are a religious figure to whom we pay homage and we must, you know, and they have certain rules and they've got all this stuff that, that you know, we got to do and all that stuff. Well, that's, Jesus is not that. Jesus is not a religious figure. Jesus didn't come to establish a religion. Jesus came um, to make us one with him. He came for a body. He came for a bride. He came for that which breathes of his being, that which partakes of, he says, I'm the vine, you're the branch, okay? Well, this, you know, in, in Spanish, they call these arms brazos, branches, and, you know, they're, you know, they're just branches because if you cut that arm off, it, it doesn't have a life of its own. Well, the difference with us is we do have a life of our own if you cut us off from Jesus. And if we are never introduced in a real way to Christ as life, then we will simply make Jesus a religious figure and we will try to, to grasp his teaching. Folks, even if you grasp his teaching and don't grasp the life of it, then you're not going to be able to fulfill it in the, even if you did it all perfectly. And that, isn't that the story of the prodigal son, the elder, elder son story? Isn't that his? The prodigal son messed up. He went out and he did all this stuff wrong. And, you know, what did, Jesus told the parable, he said a certain man had two sons. One went out and blew the chili and lived this way, another thing, and the other one never did anything wrong. And when the son came back, when the young one came back who'd messed up and everything, he realized in my father's house, meaning when I have my father, I have bread. When I'm on my own, I don't. You see, and there's a print, the print, it's the principle that we're talking about here. It's not the, you know, it's not some whatever thing. And, and this is Jesus telling the story. And Jesus isn't getting down on the kid who messed up. He's saying, as long as you're coming to me, that's what I want. But he says, you know, he goes out and he meets the elder son. And the elder son says, I never did anything wrong. I have never broken your commandments. And the father said, you know, I mean, basically his, his approach was, you, but you don't have the spirit of the family. You have a spirit of independence on your own trying to do it. And that's why, guess what? That's why he was outside of the house. And the father had to go out to him. And the younger son came inside and was banqueting, eating what the father eats. You get the picture? Eating what the father eats. <clears throat> Not just eating, you know, <coughs> what he chooses. <clears throat> so, it's one thing to obtain the benefits of the cross... And it's quite another altogether to participate in the spirit that brought Jesus to that cross. Why he would go. What worked in him. 
Was it about himself or was it about others? I mean, you know, we hear, you know, we, you know, it's, you know, things amaze me sometimes in Christianity. But, you know, people go, oh, praise God, you know, Jesus died, but he rose again. And, and you know, he's, he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And, you know, praise God for the victory of, of the resurrection. And I'm thinking, what proximity do you think he had with the Father before he came down here and died on the cross? You know, they sit at his feet or in the backyard or he was the, he was God. He was the son of God. He was worshiped by angels. It says that in the, in the scriptures, he, he didn't get raised back as in the, here's how we see it. He came into this great victory folks. He at best came back to what he had before. If you understand, actually, he lost ground because he became one with us. <laughs> you know? But he... And he will forever be now a man with a body. Okay? So the resurrection, the death and the resurrection wasn't some glorious, the, the death wasn't some glorious path to something that, that he would never have gotten before. He was completely worshipped and honored as the Son of God before that ever happened. So, okay, so, so now we must ask the question, then, well, if he didn't really get that much out of it, why the heck did he do it? Well, maybe you don't ask questions in the same manner I do. But I want to know why the heck he did it. And the answer is strictly and completely for others. We're the ones who benefited from it. We're raised up and made to sit together. That's new for us, but it wasn't new for him. Are you following my line of thought here? That the that that it had to be completely selfless for him to, to go to the cross for us. Whereas if we see the cross as, a, as the road to resurrection and glory, we may choose it for completely different reasons than he chose it. And if the church world is touting all that you're going to get all that you get now and all that you're going to get and is that's what they're presenting to you and it's appealing to your greed and it's appealing to your selfishness and it's appealing to everything that would make you want to stay in that church and put your money there <laughs> then that's not the Lord I mean it's not and and I'm not saying they're not of God and they're not saved and you know, that. I'm saying that when Paul said, let these, this attitude that was in Christ, that took him to the cross, when he said, let that be in you, he was saying, you've been saved long enough, you know the benefits, you, you, you got all that, you know, that's all settled. I'm not trying to take that away from you. Do you understand how Paul would say that? He's, he, you know, I, I've established much of that in you before now. When I first came to Philippi and got thrown in jail and then we had the prayer meetings and, you know, I told you about all that stuff. But now it's time to do business with God. God wants something more than just your enjoyment of the benefits of the of the cross and you you know so the so that your title is is I am benefactor I am you know I'm the one or, or the, not benefactor but I'm the the one who gets the benefits of all of this what did Jesus get well it sounds like what he got in the deal is a whole bunch of selfish people to be with him do you think that's really what he wanted is that, does that even make sense? You know, and of course it, 
it cannot make sense in the kingdom of God. It will not make sense to God when we stand before God. It, it, it is completely contrary, first of all, to his being in nature, the one we're going to quote unquote stand before. The, the, the very being of, of, his, of, his, of his nature, and second of all, it was contrary to the purpose of Christ in coming, and, and third, it is contrary to his heart's desire in even saving us, that he, um, I remember in the priesthood class, I said he saved us to make us priests. He didn't just save us so Jesus would be our high priest and that's it. I mean, I know that's how everybody thinks. Well, there's really only one priest other than, you know, and that's Jesus and he's my high priest. And, and what that means to me is that I can run into the Holy of Holies and, and get stuff from him. Folks, any priest in the Old Testament of which Jesus is the fulfillment you didn't run into the Holy of Holies and get stuff. You brought stuff. And that stuff that you brought represented, was a lamb, spotless, that you said, I know what God wants. He wants his son. He wants his son in the lamb manner, not in the manner of, of a bear or, a, you know, a, a, an eagle or a, you know, lion or something like that. He wants his son in this manner, and the way the manner was described was just one word, lamb. Yeah. Lamb. And I know that's what God wants. Well, folks, that was just a shadow. He wants that through us, but guess what? He wants us to be priests and us to offer that yes. to God, just like the priest did. Only we're giving him the real lamb. And it's not just, lamb is not just a word that you can use interchangeably with Jesus. Jesus, folks, you know, I mean, I love I loved the hippies that came to the Lord. I was part of that. I was part of the Jesus movement, and it was, it was really cool. I mean, there's no question about it. But the, but the concept of Jesus that we grasped barely touched the reality of Jesus. And here's what I mean. Well... You know, there's a song came out back then called Me and Jesus Got a Groovy Thing Going. Well, I got news for you. The cross circumvents you uh, and your groovy thing and sets in motion not the lack of you or the lack of grooviness, but redefines it by life, redefines it by, um, you know, in, in simple terms. Jesus says to selfish people, thousands of them gathered around, he says, it's more blessed to give than receive. I mean, can you imagine the first time those words were uttered? I think it was, you know, the Sermon on the Mount or whatever, you know. Can you imagine the, 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 you think people think thoughts after hearing a phrase from somebody? Do you think people might even think contrary thoughts after hearing somebody's, can you imagine? I mean, I can't imagine. <laughs> I'm teasing. So they, <laughs> so they, he says, it is more blessed to give than receive. I know if I was standing there, I'm sorry. I know what I would have thought. I might have even turned to somebody and said it. In fact, to this day, I do. I have my own saying. I say it's, it's better to have gifts than receipts. <laughs> That's not in the Bible. It's not in the Lord, but it shows you where my mind was. So, so the concept is contrary to everything I know. It's better to give than receive. No, no, I'm sorry. He didn't say it's better to give. 
He said it's more blessed. If he had have said it's better to give than receive, I could have said amen to the concept. Amen to the concept. I'm sure it is. Doesn't work in me, but I have something in me that says heartily, amen. It's better. But Jesus didn't say it's better to give. He said it's more blessed. When he says that, I have to go, uh-uh. When it's me. Uh-uh. It's not really. It's not more blessed. I, you know, dude, maybe that's the way you are. Well, that's exactly the case. That, see, see, that's why being real will get you down the road a lot quicker than all this religious garbage and trying to act certain ways and be something and look a certain way and, and wear certain clothes and use certain terminology and all the things that rob us of life. Because you will, you learn by your mistakes. You learn more from your failures than you do from your blessings. And that's a fact. If I had, if I had the knowledge of God to go back in your life and draw up several of your most blessed times and could just immediately point to you and say, well, now what did you learn from this? Remember when da 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 da? You'd go, you know, if, you, if I don't give you enough time to come up with a religious answer. No, see, a couple of you laughed, and those are, those are the kind of people I like. Because you're like me. We do that. We will come up with a religious answer. You know, when we need to forsake it all and go for Jesus in a real way. What does that mean? How do I do that? I don't know. Ask God. Say to him, what does that mean? How do I do that? Say, well, if they just have an altar call, but if, if somebody had an altar call, that, you know, I'm just going to say this, you know, and I do altar calls and stuff, but nine times out of ten, they're not going to hit you right where you need to be hit. So you're going to have to be open and let then say, God, hit me. Yeah. Well, and I don't think we have to wait for a service or a Sunday. You know? I don't even think we have to wait for lunch break. Okay. All right. So I'm sorry I got off on this more blessed to give than receive, but buried in that is the seed. And I, let me just say it like this. Buried in that is the seed of God. Because that's how God is. Right? And the thing that makes us human and him God is that seed. But if you want to become a son of God, is it not written in the scripture? You are sons of God. And doesn't it say that we have become partakers of the divine nature? Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that, you know, when I walk, I, I, I'm about two inches off the ground and I just float in. I've got the divine nature, you know. And, and when I smack my hands together, sparks fly out. Well, then, what, then, then where do we go? We, you know, some of you are thinking, well, I'm, I never would have thought of that, you know. Well, you're not thinking about the lamb either. So where are you going? What? It's just ethereal, you know. I've got the divine nature. Well, do you show any signs of it? <laughs> you know, it's like we say, I got Jesus in my heart. Your heart's like a lockbox, like a little prison. Jesus is there standing at the bars going, please let me out. I'm sorry, I said, I, I responded when you said, come into my heart, Jesus. <laughs> I've been here for 20 years, and I got nothing. You don't even feed me. <clears throat> anyway. 
So, I mean, and, and letting, call, asking Jesus to come into your heart can be just a religious experience without Jesus, because your heart is not a room. Your heart is the seat of motivation. And Jesus sits on the throne of the heart. Jesus dwells in your heart. Or does he? And the answer is, well, I'm sure he's in there somewhere because when you asked him to come in, I'm sure he came in. But because of your misconceptions, he's ended up like in your big toe or something because he's certainly not on the seat of your motivations. <laughs> okay, you know, it's like, Jesus, you know. I feel him in my feet, you know, because that's the only place he is. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Um, <clears throat> let me read a little bit. <clears throat> it is, uh, it's one thing to become a benefit benefactor, beneficiary, and quite another to be motivated in the same manner as Christ crucified. <clears throat> it is this contrast that set up verses 1 and 2 that we've already read. Paul seeks for these saints to not only be blessed by the cross, but to take it up daily as an approach in terms of relations with others. All right. So what so we have we have options because God gave us free will that gives us options as to how to think, um, uh, uh, as to how, which choice we will make that um, verse say. In other words, well, one way is um, that we're not just going to become beneficiaries. We're going to, have to take up the cross daily, and that means we're going to have to do without, and we're going to have to suffer, and people will really mistreat us, and life is going to be so hard, and I hate this kind of Christianity. I wish I was in a prosperity movement church. <clears throat> well, that's not the kind of Christianity Paul is talking about because it's not the kind of Christ that he's talking about. He said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy, heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Anybody ever notice that? Wait a minute. You said, come unto you, and you'll give me rest, and then you dump a yoke on me. Or is anybody following this? You know, has anybody ever even noticed that before? You know, it's like, in my early days, like, I, I don't know if I trust him. I'm, if I get too close, you know, it's like, it's like, my dog soldier we have a leash around his neck that because he he runs from you if you if you make a step for him he'll go back because he knows you're going to try to get hold of that leash and stuff like that you take another step and he'll go back a little more and he's funny because he'll go you know <clears throat> and uh, now i lost the reason why i was going to do that oh that's the way we are with the lord and we, and we think that he's, you know, th we, we can read into that. Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, you guys that are worn out and just been carrying so much and everything, and I will give you rest. I'm going to dump a yoke on you. And we go, this is horrible. I, I don't want this, you know. Well, folks, that is your mind, your free will at work to choose something that he's not saying. No, I, I'm, I'm absolutely, because, um, well, I, for some reason I'm thinking of when we were in Ireland this last time and, and the time before, uh, we'd go down on the streets of Galway and we would do music and stuff like that and we'd also have clowns dressed up, you know, people dressed up as clowns and stuff like that and dancing around and doing all this stuff. And... Um, um, Alana, among others, would say, you know, they'd just go, I don't want to be a clown. I don't want to dress up like a clown. I don't want to look like a clown. I don't want to act crazy in front of these people. And, you know, and other, we've had that happen many different times, uh, Martha and others, you know. Um, and so it's like there's this nightmare. You know, first of all, a lot of people are scared of clowns, you know. 
I knew, you know, I knew this person. Somebody told me about it. I don't know. It might have been somebody here. That there was somebody that does skin diving, and it's this woman, and she swims with sharks, but she's scared of clowns. Okay, I knew I heard it somewhere, and you know, and she, but she's scared of clowns. They're going, you'll swim with sharks, but you're scared of clowns. You know, just slap them, their nose will come off. You know. Um, yeah, not the shark nose, the, the clown. <laughs> Well, so you're, so you're, you're looking at this ministry of being on the street and acting like a clown and dressing up and doing these things and all that. You're looking at that totally through your own fears. Do you, do I, you know, do you, can, can you at least see that that could be the case? That totally through your own fears, you're bringing in, well, this and that, and, you know, and then there was this, and I remember, you know, one time somebody laughed at me, and I felt like a clown, and they even said, hey, clown, and, you know, who knows? Wherever you go with all this, I, you know, it can, go, it can take a million different directions. But there's all this fear, past uh, um, uh, encounters, and everything else, nothing based on making all things Christ and therefore you getting in that situation and somehow become Christ. Well, I wouldn't have thought that could be the case. Well, you know. So many of these people, I've seen them get in there. I've had them come to me later and say, God, I love being a clown. I just, this is so wonderful. And I'm saying, now why, how did, what's, what's the big change? I mean, you were like, this was your biggest nightmare, you know, and that, you know, you were going to secretly, you know, assassinate Kelly for asking you to do it. <laughs> and now you can't wait to do it again. And they said, when I got in the, the clown outfit, I realized nobody knew it was me, that I could do anything that I would never do publicly or whatever. I can act crazy, I can run around, I can do, and I, I, I can just have fun, everything that you'd want to do, just, you know, oh, free, you know, like a hippie or something like that. You know, <laughs> you know? And I still to this day do weird things and freak people out. <clears throat> I remember when we were, we had to catch a, a plane and, uh, at, at Madrid and we spent the night there and we'd come walking or we stayed there half the day or something. And we, we had to leave and go out though and then come back in. When I walked out, you know how the doors slide open and there's all these people waiting for their expected guest, you know, and here's a foreign country, you know. And the thing slides open and I walk out and go, ah, and they're all going, what the heck is that? I can hear somebody, I don't know what the word is in Spanish, but I can hear him say a clown in Spanish. When Jesus comes, when it's no longer about you, when it's no longer about your fears, when all of a sudden you see, I'm using, still talking about climbing, you see little children's faces light up to see you come in whereas they never did before, but you're coming with a track and you're coming with something to bless them with and, and a million little things are opening up to you. All of a sudden, you're seeing it through the eyes of the Lord. All of a sudden, you're in the Lord. All of a sudden, it is the Lord. All of a sudden, it's taking you out of all of your fears and all of the self-righteousness and the pride and the, oh, I wouldn't want to dress up like a clown. Well, have you looked in the mirror lately? Anyway, uh, sorry. And, you know, it's, a, it's just you. It's just your opinion there, what you're wearing, but <clears throat> anyway, sorry. Um, all right, I need to get off the clown thing because <laughs> uh, I'm going to make people mad now. <clears throat> so we were having fun until you started talking like that. <clears throat> all right, yeah. How did, how, did, uh, how did your pastor die? He got... <laughs> He got surrounded by seven clowns. They beat him to death. <laughs> All right. 
Um, <clears throat> Paul seeks for these saints to not only be blessed by the cross, but to take it up daily. Um, I've seen in verse 3 through 4 how the Philippians treat one another is not just placed as a moral teaching, but placed in the context of the cross, and that's important. Because I'm a, let me say it like this, and then before you get upset, I'll explain it. There is no moral teaching. There is no moral code. The Jews had one called the Ten Commandments. There is no moral code now. The, the law is written in our hearts by the life of Christ coming in. And now the, the things that were law and put in tables of stone as moral code are fulfilled by life. Does that do away with moral, you know, if, if you will, can I say it like this now? Does that do away with morals? No, of course not. It doesn't do away with with anything other than you trying to do it, you thinking you can do it, you thinking God wants you to do it, or you um, uh, um, looking to Jesus to help you instead of Jesus being the pure son of God that he was and will be in you, the selfless son of God. And so Paul is, um, is not giving them moral teachings. But he is talking about serving one another and loving one another, which is our moral in nature. Can I get an amen? It is moral in nature. But he's not imparting that by a moral code. He's pointing them to the cross. Now, here, this is important. He's not pointing them to Jesus. Why would you say that? Because we have a concept of Jesus outside of the cross. We say in our mind, because of our teaching, we think that the cross was just an event that Jesus just showed up and did one day, but really the rest of the time he just lived the rest you know, like selfish like us. Or not. Just a good guy. Okay, And if you believe that, then you don't have to point to the cross. You just point to Jesus. But Paul didn't point to Jesus generically, ethereally. Well, you just need to. And, and they never say stuff like this. As, I, I'm, as if I'm one of the writers. Well, brothers and sisters... Follow the way that Jesus did when he walked the shores of Galilee. They never say anything like that. They never mention Galilee. They never mention the miracles of Jesus. They never mention him feeding the 5,000. I'm talking about the New Testament writers after the Gospels. The Gospels uh, are the story of Jesus before the cross, therefore before the church. You can't, you can't, you can't fulfill what Jesus did. You can only allow the fulfillment of Christ in you. And that, you have to be the church, the body of Christ. So, there, so it has to be after death and resurrection. Now some of y'all got that. I don't think many of you fully got it because there, God has shown me a clarity within the last couple of years that has just cut to the very bone. These New Testament writers are constantly pointing to Christ and Him crucified. They're constantly pointing to the cross. They are never just pointing to the way Jesus was before we were one with Him. And they're, and they're pointing to the cross because at the cross we became one. Because at the cross we got our hope. Because at the cross we are able to be raised up in newness of life. We're able to be raised up into one new man. That man is Christ, the body is us. All of that happens strictly by the cross. There ain't no way he would tell you to copy the Gospels. He shows you the Gospels to show you what that life is like on the inside of you. 
Does that make sense? So that means you, you, that means you can't say it's Jesus and then trample people down. You can't say it's Christ in me and be a user. Well, you can. You can say it. But, but just before you say it, warn me so I can get back in case the earth opens up. <laughs> All right. I don't, I don't, I, w I want to tell you that what I did over the last two years is I, I got challenged two years ago by the Holy Spirit, and I have been in the scriptures, not the gospels, not the Old Testament, but the New Testament. And you know, you know, having, you know, Jewish blood and everything, I just love the Old Testament. Man, I see stuff like crazy in the Old Testament. It's just part of my heritage, you know what I mean? To the Jews were given the oracles of God. But I spent the last two years really scanning the New Testament in light of what I heard the Holy Spirit saying. And what I heard him saying is, Randy, you, not, he wasn't talking about y'all here or those people out there. He said, you have a concept of Christ in you that is not always Christ uh, crucified. I was shocked. I mean, I thought if anybody preaches Christ crucified, bless God, I do. Right? And for the Holy Spirit to point that out to me and to say that, I just went, oh my God, you know, this, I know it's right. I know that voice. And so I decided I was going to start with the seeds of what I saw here in Philippians. I was going to go through the rest of the books of the Bible. And I, I'm, I'm not just shocked. I'm blown away. I'm totally blown away. Because before, I would have referred to Jesus. And I did it a lot. All You go back for years on my tapes and stuff like that. Well, it has to be Christ in you. But let me tell you something. The, this is, you know, and this is just me talking. You don't have to believe this if, if you don't want it or whatever. But the more pure way of saying it would have to be Christ crucified because the cross is not just an example. It represents how it represents the Christian experience. Christ crucified does, not Christ on the shores of Galilee. That God set that one moment is time. What, how does it say it in Galatians about the, in the fullness of time? That God set that event above everything. And if you just started, if you just started reading, uh, honestly, if you just took a nonchalant reading of several of the books of the Bible, you would be shocked how often Paul says Jesus and the cross and death or resurrection, because it's all, it's all, for him, that's it. That's the, you know, that's the focal point. And he doesn't stray from it because the way that the Holy Spirit showed him was not, not just, now hear me out, and we'll explain this as we go, not just the cross, but Christ crucified. Because Christ crucified explains the two pieces of wood. And it also explains Paul's directions and decisions and crazy things that he allowed that he would never have allowed because of, because of just Jesus in general, just a Jesus sitting on the throne somewhere that showers blessings or that whatever. You know, that, that's why the book of Revelation, you know what, I'm, I need to end this now. We went a little over, but... Um, that's why the book of Revelation ends with the primary name used for Jesus is Lamb. You know that. The last book is talking about Jesus, right? And over, I think it's 22 times. I could be mistaken on that, but I think it's, it's a bunch. It uses Lamb for Jesus. It doesn't say Jesus. It says Lamb. And then the picture of our Lord that it gives is a lamb slain, but on a throne. But, but him, 
He's a lamb slain. He's not a lamb throned. If you, you know what I'm saying when I say that. He's a lamb slain, enthroned, but he's not. It is Christ crucified. It is not just Christ. And that the term Christ crucified defines God. Defines him. It's a definition of God. I mean, if you let that sink in, it will, I mean, it'll rip a veil open so that when you read the word, you won't just see words. You'll begin to go, my God, these people, they were like bloodhounds on a trail and it was that one trail, and they wouldn't let it go because they saw this is the this is the focal point. This is the fullness. This is where anything else that happened that included him, we're not even going to mention that because this right here is what the, it all culminates in, and there you can truly see it. Well, once you see it there at the cross, once you see Christ crucified at the cross, then you can understand it's more blessed to give than receive. Can I get amen? Then you can understand it. Then a million sayings come to life, but you can't attribute any of those just to Jesus. And yes, it is just Jesus because he's lamb slain. That's just Jesus. But it's not just Jesus because he didn't end the book with the churches gathering unto him and just say, you know, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus said, lamb, lamb slain. And they followed the lamb wherever so he, he goes. Well, I know where he goes. Paul followed him wherever he went. All right, let's, let's close this out. Father, we just ask you to, to bless the uh, sharings that we've had tonight. And I know that it's all still preliminary for everyone. But Lord, you have released from heaven certain things uh, to my heart that, uh, that have become pearls of great price to me. And I pray that they not be cast before swine, but, Father, that each heart will go before you and ask you your opinion and ask you if there's something to it for you to show them. And if there's not, let it be wiped from their memory, Father, if it's not from you. But if it is, grant them an entrance into these things, Father, so that we may all feast at this table together. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.